Good morning. Good morning. We're excited to have you here on the campus of Coppin State University. We also want to welcome our guests who are viewing uh, this program online. Uh, my name is Dr. Johnny Rice II. I'm the chair and associate professor of the Department of Criminal Justice in the College of Behavioral Social Sciences at the Coppin State University. Again, we welcome you to the 15th annual Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. birthday tribute celebration. Uh, a couple of items I want to touch on first in terms of housekeeping for our guests who are here on campus. Uh, we have hand sanitizer as well as masks that are available for those who need it. Uh, if you go out into the hallway and swing around to your left, and walk down the hallway, you will see the men's room and ladies' room, uh, respectively. And also, uh, we ask that uh, you, if you have not already partake of the, partake of the breakfast, please make sure that uh, you do so. Uh, and again, we want to uh, welcome all of our uh, guests uh, who are here uh, today. And those guests include uh, faculty, staff, students, uh, community-based guests, keynote speaker, as well as our distinguished uh, honorees who will be recognized today. And so again, uh, I thank you and welcome you. It has been, I believe, two years, two to three years since we have been back together. The last two years, we have had great uh, MLK celebrations online but it is always uh, a joy to be able to come together uh, as a community. And can we clap to that? <laughs> the theme of our event uh, this uh, year uh, is one that uh, resonates uh, with many of you all in society, and that theme is creating an anti-racist society and we must continue to counter racial prejudice, systemic racism and oppression uh, and we have to do that uh, through conscious uh, and deliberate actions. Uh, and so today we channel the spirit of Dr. King as we uh, enjoy breaking bread together and as we also uh, enjoy uh, our program and recognizing uh, our distinguished uh, awardees. So at this time, I would like to ask Dr. Errol Bolden, who's the Interim Associate Provost and Associate Vice President for Academic Affairs, to come to the podium and to provide the invocation. Can we clap it up for Dr. Earl Sebastian Bolden? <laughs> A pleasant good morning to each of you and Happy New Year. As we were told, the theme for this year is creating an anti-racist society. But even as we do this, we realize that it's not a simple um, challenge and that we do have to recognize that it would be a spiritual challenge as well. So if you'll join me now, for the invocation. Ultimate nurture and transform of our lives. As we begin this year's journey of faith into the unknown, we would first like to thank you. Thank you for 2022's journey that has now ended with all of the blessings and opportunities you freely provided. In your generosity, you continue to provide love without limits and grace without measure. Even if I had a thousand tongues, that clearly would not be enough to thank you for your loving kindness and mercy towards us. As we unpacked in preparation for this year's journey, we had to discard some of the unnecessary or restrictive weight that we were carrying. In so doing, 
We begin this year's journey not burdened by the past, but refreshed, prepared to receive from your bounty. May we be granted favor in your sight so that our territory would be enlarged. May we accept what is needed to fully honor that gift. With these and added treasures, may we share with our loved ones and those who are in need, expecting nothing in return. As we are granted the gift of life, may our testimony at the end of this year's journey be one that celebrates your goodness towards us and our obedience to your will. Order our steps according to your word as you, you illuminate each path that we must travel. For these things and more, we approach your th uh, throne on this day in your loving son's name. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Bolden. At this time, we will have the musical selection, Lift Every Voice and Sing. Uh, this video will be courtesy of the 105 Voices of History National HBCU Choir and Concert Leadership arranged by Roland M. Carter, and of course, lyrics by James Weldon Johnson and music by Rosamond Johnson, if we could all stand.
Thank you. You may be seated. They say music is the universal language, and that is truly inspiring. At this time, my colleague, Dr. Denise Watis Daniels, Director, Simulation Center, and Associate Professor for the School of Nursing here at Coppin State University, will bring the occasion. And following the occasion, Dr. Watis Daniels will introduce our president, Dr. Anthony Jenkins. Can we clap it up for Dr. Watis Daniels? <laughs> Good morning. That was awesome. I don't know if you were like me, but I was standing there beaming like my child was there. Because th those are our young people and it was just so exciting to see them sing. Well, I wanna welcome you to our 15th annual Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. birthday tribute breakfast. We come together every year to celebrate the life and legacy of Dr. King and to honor members of our community that have made a significant contribution to the citizens of Baltimore. You know, yesterday marked the 94th birthday of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. I will always remember because he was born the same year my mother was born. And it's the only federal holiday that is designated as a national day of service. And this is to encourage all Americans to volunteer and to improve their communities. The King holiday is a defining moment in each year where Americans across the country will step up and make their communities more equitable to take action to create a what Dr. King called a beloved community. This was part of the dream of Dr. King. He believed that a unified community was possible. He acknowledged that it takes a lot of effort, that you have to fight for systematic change. Dr. King is an example of our call to action. Dr. King's dream was he believed that individuals, regardless of race, ethnicity, culture, gender, could be free to stand as equal individuals and members of society. He dedicated his life to public service. It is so befitting of us that we celebrate his legacy by recognizing individuals that have made a significant contribution to our community. But I challenge you, let us not only celebrate Dr. King in January. I happen to love January because what we have done, and I know you have identified it too, we kind of slide January into February. And so we don't have Black History Month. We have Black History Season because it starts off in January and we continue into February. So I challenge you today, let the words that are spoken here today strengthen our commitment to serve. Think back, what have I done? What can I do? And what will I do to support my community? And so without further ado, I bring to you our esteemed president, Dr. Anthony L. Jenkins. Good morning. Good morning. And Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Doc, I'm going to have to agree with you. That video is. Um, there was one thing missing, though. I felt y'all looking at me when they were saying, <laughs> I got you, I got you. 
But I tell you, every time I hear that song, and, and I've seen that video before, I, I, I listen to it, and I always get this vision of the door of no return. And you listen to that song, and you imagine what walking to that door must have been like. And I don't know if there's ever a feeling that we today could compare to that. But that's a powerful song, and that, and that image always comes to my, to my mind. And fast forward, we're here to celebrate an incredible person, an incredible man. And on behalf of Coppin State University and the entire Eagle Nation, I want to welcome you to our beautiful campus. Show of hands, how many of those, this is your first time to campus? Let's give them a round of applause and welcome them. My hope is that it will not be your last. We welcome those who are here with us in person as well as those who are viewing through our live stream to the 15th annual Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. birthday uh, tribute celebration. I also want to acknowledge and thank Dr. Johnny Rice and the planning committee for again putting together another wonderful event. You know, this year's program and theme, Creating a Anti-Racist Society, is profoundly timely and speaks to the cornerstone of Dr. King's dream, his purpose, and his legacy. It is an honor to have all of you all with us today as we engage in this conversation, as we hear uh, thoughtful presentations, and as we re-energize ourselves to stay the course and not get weary. We celebrate today, in my opinion, one of the greatest Americans our nation has ever produced. Because I'm not sure there are many folks out there today that would sacrifice what he did. Now we get too comfortable with our homes and our cars, our materialistic possessions, and we're only willing to go so far. So my hope is that throughout our discussion today and our time together, that some of us continue to be uncomfortable enough to make sure that his dream never dies. See, Dr. King's life was an example of extraordinary servant leadership. His voice and vision still gives hope to a nation that 55 years after his death, continues to struggle with its self-created issues and isms that keep us from a more perfect union, from expediting equity, equality, and a more just nation for all Americans, especially African Americans. And as an HBCU in the 21st century, I am proud of the great work that Coppin State University is doing to realize Dr. King's dream through our ability to create upward mobility and economic mobility for students, their families, and the communities that we serve. See, Dr. King knew that no one person could achieve the seismic culture shift and change that America needed. And he was keenly aware that the more we pushed racism to the fringes of our society, that the harder racist would fight to keep their oppressive grip of power on this nation. And while there has been progress made in the 55 years since Dr. King's death, that progress does not begin to repay the sacrifices and the contributions that African Americans have made to this nation. Our nation has yet to fulfill its promise etched in the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. Therefore, we must continue to commit ourselves to the work of Dr. King and moving this nation ever forward. And I want to thank all of you all for the work that you've put in, for the sacrifice, for the effort, to make sure year after year we continue 
to push and challenge, that we continue to fight to address the social and racial inequalities that exist in our society. Because what you do is truly the cornerstone of Dr. King's dream, his purpose, and his legacy. And it also embodies the motto of Coppin State University, nurturing potential, transforming lives. Because that is what King's dream is all about. Continuing to address these social and racial inequalities through your work will be a testament to how we hand the baton off to the next generation. Because many of you in this room have been running your leg of the race for some time. And now it's time for the next generation to step up and not to become comfortable with the gains that we've made, but yet to see them as a motivator that there is more work to be done. See, I am honored that we are having this program this year on this campus and that we have the faculty and the staff who are committed to making sure that their knowledge is passed on to our students and they are empowered and motivated to go out and do even more. So as we fight, continue to keeping Dr. Dream, Dr. King's dream alive, it is important that we make sure that we are willing to lock arms and stand in the gap when others refuse to. That is the strength in the American dream. That is the power of the human fight. So I wanna welcome you again to Coppin State University and to this wonderful program that Dr. Johnny Rice and the planning committee has put on today. I also want to acknowledge and thank Dr. Whitehead who will bring a powerful message for us to hear. I also want to acknowledge our honorees and our awardees who will be uh, highlighted today as well. But I also want to take a moment to thank the faculty and staff of Coppin State. In fact, if I can have the faculty and staff of Coppin to please stand up. I want to thank you for your sacrifice and your commitment every day. I want to thank you for what you do because what you do is truly at the heart of what Dr. King was trying to fight for during his time with us. As I've said to my faculty all along, there's no question that Coppin State is an incredible institution. There's no question that we produce students who go out and transform every environment that they enter. But they don't do that by happenstance. They do it because the faculty and staff of this institution are committed to making sure they understand that earning your degree does not mean that you're educated. Education is about action. And every day, the faculty and staff of this university get up and they move towards this campus with action and determination and commitment to make every day better and to help every student reach their fullest potential. Thank you all very much, Dr. Rice. Thank you for what you have done for this institution, your leadership and planning this wonderful event. Again, let's have a wonderful day and I look forward to learning from all of you all how we collectively help Dr. King's dream become a reality. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jenkins. And you know, what resonates in my ear is just that, uh, the theme of, you know, getting out of our comfort zone and continuing to do the, the work that needs to be done. So again, thank you, uh, Dr. Jenkins, for your words and your leadership. At this time, I have the pleasure of introducing Mr. Levita Juma, CSU class of 23, social work major. Can we clap it up? He will come up to the podium and provide spoken word.
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, Dr. Jenkins, for that marvelous speech, and thank you, uh, Dr. Rice, for the introduction. So today I will be sharing with you guys my poem, which is called Anti-Racist. Am I anti-racist? Wait. Are you anti-racist? Wait. Are they anti-racist? Hmm. These are questions that linger in the minds of those who can't separate a friend from a foe. It's hard for your mind to escape the thoughts of when you know people are discriminating against you based on the color of your skin. If we all hate each other, honestly, nobody wins. So take that racist, you know what, and throw it in the trash can. Am I anti-racist? Wait, are you anti-racist? Wait, are they anti-racist? Hmm. Long live Martin Luther King, because in the midst of it all, he rose. He worked hard to fight against Jim Crow. He did it for those who felt ostracized. He did it even though he felt scrutinized. Long live Martin Luther King. His story motivates me to thrive. How can anti-racism start? I can't hear you. Hold on, I have an idea. It starts with love, peace, empathy, togetherness, reasoning, safety, and diversity. It starts with love, peace, reasoning, safety, and diversity. But let's not only talk about it, let's be about it. And I would like for you guys to say this with me. I'm gonna say, am I anti-racist? Are you anti-racist? And are they anti-racist? So let's go ahead. Am I anti-racist? Are you anti-racist? Are they anti-racist? Let's not only talk about it, but let's be about it. I want to thank uh, Levita for those powerful words. And, and I, I, I would be remiss if I did not uh, state this. You know, when we talk about contributions to the, the campus community, uh, contributions to the broader society, uh, some of our students may feel like, you know, once I get my degree, then I can give back. But we have students every day who are here each semester who through cultural enrichment activities, academic enrichment activities, uh, through sports, uh, they give back uh, on daily basis. And with LaVita, uh, he had to make some adjustments with his schedule so he could be here today. And I just wanna acknowledge the importance of having a student voice here today uh, and student representation. So if we could clap it up one more time for LaVita. <laughs> It is my honor to introduce our keynote, distinguished keynote speaker uh, for our event today. Dr. Carsonia, Carsonia, affectionately known as Dr. K, Wise Whitehead, has associate, is the Associate Professor of Communications and African American Studies at Loyola University of Baltimore. She is a three-time New York Emmy-nominated documentary filmmaker and award-winning radio host of Today with Dr. K on WEAA. And many of you all may listen to her on a daily basis uh, and enjoy uh, the thought-provoking -provo discussions that occur uh, on her radio show. She is the founder and director of the Carson Institute of Race, Peace, and Social Justice, as well as the executive director of the Emily France Davis Center for Education, Research, and Culture. Her scholarship examines the ways race, class, gender, coalesce in American classrooms, as in political as well as social environments. And a couple of other key things I want to touch upon uh, in terms of accomplishments uh, associated with Dr. K's distinguished career. Uh, she was the Gilda Lerman Preserve American Maryland History Teacher of the Year. Uh, she was the Gilda Lerman Fellowship in American History uh, and the Colle Collegium Visionary Award recipient. She's won several prestigious honors as the At Black Mommy activist. And also she was named one of Essence Magazine's 2019 Woke 100 Women, Changing the World, and the best radio host in Baltimore by the Baltimore Sun. She's recognized as one of the top 100 women in Maryland by the Daily Record, 
and one of the 25 women to watch by the Baltimore Sun. Uh, she, of course, is an educator, a K-12 master teacher in African American history, and has worked more than 1,000 teach worked more with worked with more than 1,000 teachers. That's a lot of teachers to become culturally responsive educators in diverse environments, and has served as a consultant for a series of documentaries in Philadelphia. Uh, in her book, 2014 Notes from a Colored Girl: The Civil War Pocket Diaries of Emily Francis. Davis won the Darlene Clark Hine Book Award from the Organization of American Historians. And I could go on and on uh, in regards to the accomplishments of Dr. K, but when I think of Dr. K, particularly as someone who is a local uh, resident, uh, born and raised here in, in Baltimore City, I think of a person who speaks truth to power, a person who always looks out for those who have uh, may not have a voice and someone who is always pushing the group forward to think about how to create a better and more just society. So it's my honor to present to you today, Dr. K. Good morning. I was thinking when I saw the young people singing, lift every voice and sing. When I drop my sons off to college, I do have two college age sons. Every year I try to give them a word to help shape what they're going to do. Sometimes I, I give them a plant and I talk about it. Sometimes I put a rock in their hand. And my senior year one, his sentence was building your dreams on our tears and prayers. Because when I left college, what I left him with is the same thing my father left me with, which was an empty box on my bed. I went to Lincoln University, Pennsylvania. My dad said, that box may look empty to you, but it's full of all of our tears and all of our prayers. And when you think you can't make it, when they tell you you're not good enough, just go and put your hands on that box. Because as we prayed and cried for you, our grandmothers prayed and cried for us and we can take it all the way back. Year two, it was freedom is a complete sentence. And I put a rock in his hand and said, as a young African-American man, you need to understand you're already free. Your freedom does not have to be asked for or begged for. It's already guaranteed to you. Just like no is a complete sentence, so is freedom. Year three, I told him, you're a junior. Your sentence is, you are the one we have been waiting for. You need to be prepared for graduation, which is right around the corner, because your daddy and I said four years. So you can go five on your own. We're going to go four with you. So you need to be ready for what's coming. But when I dropped him off this year, year four, as a senior, you know, they get out the car really quickly. They don't look back. They're ready to move on. They're starting their life. I mean, they only call you for money. Right? That's all they ever do. But year four was do not get drunk on the wine of the world and forget who you are. And I thought about that as I sat there listening to lift every voice and sing. We don't often think about what it means to tell our children not to get drunk off the wine of the world. I'm delighted to be here, and I thank you so much, Dr. Rice, for the invitation. I thank you so much to your distinguished president who had the opportunity to interview for Maryland Public Television. I thank you to all of you in the audience. I have some sorors here of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. I say happy Founders Day to my sorority sisters, and to my friend Beverly Burke, uh, who has joined me here. I also see my friend Kevin Carr, which was a surprise to see. I'm so glad you're here, sir. I stand here this morning on the shoulders of Harriet Tubman, who said we will always move forward and never turn back. I'm on the shoulders of Mary Church Terrell, who reminded us as black women that we must lift as we climb. I stand here on the shoulders of Mary McLeod Bethune, who told young black girls, whatever the white man has done, we have done and done better. And I stand here on the shoulders of my soror from Baltimore, Verda Friedman Welcome, who said, our sex and our color are not barriers, regardless of what others may tell us. Thank you. 
I stand here today looking out over the next generation because I understand we can only see so far because they stood up and they survived racism and sexism and classism in this democratic experiment. I am here simply to mark this occasion to think about the legacy of Dr. King, to think about the legacy of Coretta Scott King, and to think about what does it mean to build an anti-racist society. I must admit that I actually have no idea what that means anymore. I thought I did. I thought we were very clear that we were fighting against racism. We were fighting against white supremacy. We were fighting against whiteness itself. That's what I thought we were doing. I'm not so sure anymore. Because I'm looking out and I'm realizing that the white supremacist values that we're fighting are sometimes deep rooted in our own community. Sometimes we're thinking about trying to root up what's wrong with us. The people that are actually oppressing us are ones who look like us. So I don't know how to do an anti-racist society when all black people are in power. And they say, well, I'm not racist because I'm black. But if you lift up white supremacy, if you hold up the values that say that we are nothing, then actually you are a part of the problem and you need to be rooted out. Not a popular position in this city. I'm here today to mark the moment because I don't think we spend enough time thinking about Dr. King. I was saying on my radio show yesterday that everybody loves Dr. King, March on Washington back. Everyone loves a Dr. King of 1959. They lift up Dr. King of 61 and 62. They all love I Have a Dream and Mahalia Jackson singing, tell them about the dream, Martin. Nobody wants to talk about the Dr. King of 66 who said maybe we've integrated into a burning house. Nobody wants to get into the Dr. King of 67 saying, you know what the real problem in America are the three evils of militarism, materialism, which is capitalism, and racism. Nobody wants to talk about the Dr. King of 68 who said, look, there's a very clear plan against me in my life. Do not stop moving when they stop me. He had by that time been arrested more than 30 times. His house had been bombed multiple times. They had tried time and time again to assassinate him. On the way to Memphis, they said, you know what? If Dr. King's on board the plane, everybody has to get off because they said there's a bomb on it. He said, I know my life is limited here. You have to be committed to not stopping. So we are marking this moment because I don't think we're teaching our children about the real Dr. King. I think we've lost him. I think we've lost Dr. King. Dr. King used to belong to us. And Dr. King is now being used to sell Toyota trucks. Dr. King used to be something that we hold up and say, that's who I want to be like. And now we have Dr. King's quotes on Nike tennis shoes. Dr. King said when they asked him to run for president, he said, if I'm going to run for president, the first thing I'm going to do is dismantle the system. And now we have, I have a dream mattress sales. I sometimes wonder what does it mean when the heroes who stand against capitalism are being put on, what, $5 bills and $20 bills, which I'm thinking about Harriet Tubman, of course. I think there was a confusion. We said, run black women our money, not put us on the money. They got confused <laughs> about that. <laughs> There's something happening here. The Black History Month theme for 2023 is black resistance. And I remember when we sat in a room and we thought about the theme. I'm the former secretary for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. I'm the former secretary for the Association for the Study of African American Life and History and the current president for the National Women's Studies Association. When we talked about this year, we said black resistance because it's a year of anniversaries. The 60th anniversary of the letter from Birmingham jail, the 60th anniversary from the children's campaign, the 60th anniversary from the March on Washington, the 60th anniversary of when they bombed the 16th Street Baptist Church, blowing up black girls, and then going out in the street and killing two more black boys. That this is a moment when we think about Megger Evers being murdered in his driveway, that maybe black resistance is calling us to do more. What we have learned in this country 
ever since we've been thinking about 1619 and the incredible work that Nicole Hannah Jones did with the 1619 project. I will say I'm from South Carolina. Those of us in South Carolina had a problem with 1619 because we understand Spanish South Carolina had enslaved people before 1619. But for the sake of argument, with the 1619 Project, understanding that we finally started to think about what did it mean to have the first 20 or so African people arrive here on the shore. I think what we're starting to deal with is that our history is the American history. And it is our story and our blood and our tears, and our sacrifice, and our backs on which this country is built. And even though nobody wants to talk about it anymore, it was our prayers that got us through. It was the fact that we come from people who chose to survive, who chose to go forward rather than backwards. I think we have to think about what does it mean every day to make the decision to survive. And despite what is looking at you in the face, despite how they are treating you, despite how you're made to feel, you survive anyway. Because you know that freedom eventually is going to come. You may not be there when it gets there, but freedom is eventually going to come. Langston Hughes in his poem, Let America Be America Again, said, I am the poor white fooled and pushed apart. I am the Negro bearing slavery scars. I am the red man driven from the land. I am the immigrant clutching the hope that I seek. Oh yes, I say it plain. America never was America to me. And yet I swear this oath, America will be. I believe that all of us here can remember that moment when there was a shift that took place in the wind, when we began to realize that despite our best intentions, despite how much education we got or what neighborhoods we lived in, despite our degrees, despite our fraternity and sorority affiliations, despite our tea parties and our mink coats, despite Jack and Jill, despite the work we did for Hillary and Bill, despite the Barack Obamas, you know, painting the White House black, that our lives still did not matter. We actually could not educate ourselves out of racist treatment for our children. We could not move into a neighborhood and protect them from the racism that is so prevalent. It wasn't about putting on a suit and grabbing a briefcase when the real color that we have to deal with is a color that paints us one way and paints everybody else a different way. That the real battle that we're fighting according to the Kerner Commission of 1968, is a final battleground of the hearts and minds and souls of people in this country. The year that Dr. King was assassinated, a month before, the Kerner Commission released their report. Now, if you remember, and there's some who may be a little bit more mature in the years and can remember back with my dad. My dad said in 67, the country was on fire that if you went into black neighborhoods, the struggle that was taking place, people were frustrated with this notion of freedom, that nothing had happened with the Voting Rights Act of 65, nothing had happened since the Civil Rights Act of 64, nothing was happening in our community. Dr. King was not enough, black power was not enough, and communities were on fire in 1967. Lyndon Baines Johnson said, I gotta figure out what black people want. And if you go back and look at the transcripts, I'm not far off in paraphrasing him. He actually said, what do they want from me? Like we've given them everything. Why are they still burning stuff down? Let's figure out what black folks want. So he put together a whole commission of white men to go figure out <laughs> what black folks want. He's like, you know, y'all go figure out for me. What is it that these black folks need to shut them down? And the Kerner Commission from Otto Kerner came back and said, look, black folks actually want three things. They want education for their children to help move them along the path. They want to live in safe neighborhoods with green space. And they want to be paid according to their worth. If you just give black folks those three things,
things, we can end this race problem that we're having. Lyndon Baines Johnson said, thank you, but no thank you. I've given enough. I am not going to give more. And the Kerner Commission said the problem is not policies, practices, laws, and procedures. The problem is the hearts and minds and souls of people who are in power. 30 years later, they redid that study in 1998. They said, okay, it's been 30 years. Black folks got government jobs. They're moving up in the positions of power. Surely we can't have the same race problem 30 years later that we had in 68. Let's figure out what we're going to do. Again, they put together a committee of all white men from the Ronald Reagan Foundation and said, let's go figure out how black folks are doing. Do they have what they need? And what they found, and they said America is blacker and browner and poorer than ever. And if you look at their commission report, they said, you know what? We've got a solution for how to end this problem of race. Black folks want education for their children. They want to live in safer neighborhoods with green space. And they want to be paid their work. If we do that in 1998, we can bring these communities together. And apparently nobody was listening. And so they redid the study at the 50th anniversary. And a man named Donald Trump sat in the White House while this was being done. This time it was a really multiracial committee. And they did it outside of the government saying, you know what, what is happening in the black community? It's been 50 years since the assassination since the March on Washington, since the letter from a Birmingham jail. 50 years, what is it that's happening that we can talk about? 50 years later, they put out seven things that were needed, the top three things. Education, because we want our kids to have a better tomorrow. We want our children in kindergarten to be able to read. We don't want to spark the genius in kindergarten and extinguish it by third grade. We don't want our boys to fall behind. We want our children to graduate at the top of their class. And if they choose college or career, they have an opportunity to do both and more. We want to live in safe neighborhoods where the trash is being picked up on a regular basis, where I can sit on my porch and not be afraid I'm going to be shot, where I can sit and converse with my friends and not be concerned that the cops will roll up because I'm not doing anything but being black. And we want to get paid for our worth. We want to stop being underpaid, particularly black women, where it takes us until August of the next year to make up the dollar that our white male counterparts made the year before. They said, if you do that, you can really begin to start to stitch together this race issue. I'm not going to bore you by telling you what Donald Trump said when the report was given to him. Black lives have always been valued, even though they were told. Our ancestors were told. Our children have been told. We have been told that we don't matter. Let me do the math for you. In 1860, for example, a Virginia trader valued a 20-year-old enslaved man. He called him an extra man and an extra woman. He valued the extra man at a value of $1,500 to $1,600 for a 20-year-old enslaved man. An enslaved woman, which if you look at it, was a 13-year-old girl, they valued her at $1,325 to $1,400. So what does that mean in today's time, right? Because that doesn't sound like a lot of money if you like good shoes and red bottoms. $1,500 doesn't sound like a bunch of money, right? If you do the math today, an enslaved black man, 20 years old, $50,000. An enslaved black girl of childbearing age, $44,000. $877. In 1860, the New York Stock Exchange was the slave market, and it would determine how money was moved. So if you had more boys being born, the market would go up. If you had more 13-year-old girls being traded, the market would go up, because if you're a 13-year-old girl, you can get her pregnant every single year. 
until her womb actually drops, which typically happened by the age of 22. But you have then built an empire off the wombs of black girls and black women. Black lives have always been valued, even though we were told we didn't matter. At that time, this country was running a market on the slave trade system that was roughly worth about 12 trillion dollars. Many of the multimillionaires and billionaires today are in those positions because they come from families that were involved in this 12 trillion dollar market. And so when there was a separation with the Confederate States of America, you can say it was about empowerment and states' rights. But I think we know deep down, collectively in our genes, that it was about a $12 trillion market that was being run through our womb, on our back, with our blood, with our sweat, and with our tears. That, to me, is the real legacy of Dr. King. Here in Maryland, as we're getting ready to inaugurate the first black governor. I'm very excited about Wes Moore. I am so excited that when I saw him, I said, you know, I, I'm, I want to lift you up, but I also want to throw something in your ear as you're walking by me, Mr. Moore, if you have a minute. I said, because I just want you to investigate on your first day in office, after you change the drapes, you know, after you clear out the, you know, the closet, make sure there's nothing in the drawers, after you do all of that, please investigate why here in Maryland, we actually put $14,000 into one student. When you look at that over a year, at $14,000, breaking that up over 12 months, in the same state that we put $44,000 into an incarcerated resident, that we put more money into someone who's incarcerated than someone who should be the bright mind of the future, a difference of $30,396. If you could, Governor Moore, Take a look at what we can do to at least bring down the amount we're spending on those who are incarcerated and bring up what we're spending on our children. If you can make sure that the red line comes into Baltimore so we can get opened up for the rest of the state. If you can make sure that the money promised to us and cut off year after year by Governor Hogan, go back and pull those papers out the drawer and go ahead and sign it. Because I think we're at the place now where black faces in high spaces is not enough for us. You have got to be true to why we put you there. You've got to be true to the legacy of who we are and the fact that we get out because the highest voting percentage block in the country is black women. We will stroll to the polls. We're in our pearls, our pink and green, our crimson. We will stroll right on through and make sure you get into office. And then we sit there and say, why aren't you living up to what you promised us? Why aren't you doing what needs to be done to lift up our community? So where do we go from here? What does it mean to try to build an anti-racist society? What is the responsibility that we have to do more? I would tell you we need to do three things. That's it, just three things. I'm a PK. My dad talks in numbers, three things to do, three chores, three ways to make money, three ways to make me happy, three times to call me. Like everything's about numbers when you're a PK. Three things that I think we should do. That's it, just three. Number one, I think we need to be committed to running this race. Susan Taylor once said that the baton was dropped between her generation and ours. I told her that I disagreed with her. It may have been fumbled, it may have been slippery, but, but I would argue that those of us who are Gen X have been trying to do our part to run the race. That when we handed the baton over to the millennials, I won't make a joke and say it got dropped, I'll say instead that maybe it got a little fumble with the millennials. Maybe the millennials weren't sure about whether they wanted, but I would argue that Gen Z has picked up that baton. If you are in the classroom right now, there is something about Gen Z where they are running towards a better tomorrow, which doesn't look like my tomorrow. 
They have their own ideas about what tomorrow would look like. Think about it. These people that we're teaching now, these students that we're teaching now, they walked out for Black Lives Matter when they were in middle school. They went down to D.C. around gun control legislation. They were upset about the climate when I was still using A.C. in my car. Like this generation here, they are doing something different, which means it requires us to be willing, as Dr. Jenkins said, to give up our space in the line and make some room for the next generation. That's about succession planning. That's about learning to get out of the way. That's about understanding that the dream doesn't just belong to me. We've got to be committed to running the race. Now, when I think about running the race, I think about that runner. This was back a couple of years ago. And some of you may remember this. I feel like I'm dating myself. But there was a runner in the Olympics who when he ran one lap, he pulled up because his leg was hurting and he began to limp around the track and his father broke through the crowd and put his arm around him. So you saw father and son. So the person had already won second place and we're all watching this father help his son around the track. Now they later asked him, they said, well, why didn't you just stop? He said, because I came to Barcelona to finish a race and not just start one. They said, when did you know you were going to finish? He said, when my father came out and carried me. Folks, we got to be committed to finishing the race. We got to be committed to carrying those who may not be able to continue with us. We drag them, control them. We pray for them. We do all we can so we all can get to the finish line. That's one, we got to finish the race. Two, we got to have courage. I think a lot about what does it mean to be courageous in the face of a society that wants you gone? What does it mean to deal with real courage? I tell my sons, you play at courage. If you want to know about courage, you ask your grandfather. You ask my daddy about courage in the face of knowing about Emmett Till, about courage going out and never knowing if you want to come back home again. Real courage. You need to be strong and of good courage, as the Bible would tell us. Strong, which means you stand in your power and you don't look back. You mean you stand up when everyone is sitting down and if you have to walk away, you do it with your shoulders thrown back. You have to be courageous because this is a time that's designed to tear down our young people from the inside out. We've got to teach them how to be courageous and model for them what does courage look like in the face of terror. So one, we gotta be committed to finishing the race. Two, we have got to have courage. And three, we've got to believe in something bigger than ourselves. I tell people, if the only thing you believe in is yourself, you'll never get very far. You've got to believe in something bigger than yourself. And you've got to be able to speak your own name even when other people cannot. That's something I teach my students. Can you call your own name? Can you pray for yourself? Because there are times when things are falling down and what you have to do is you've got to be able to pray for yourself. Because not everybody's going to understand your vision. Not everybody's going to understand your dream. Let's be clear. Not everybody's going to understand you. <laughs> Let's be very clear. I mean, there are days, and I'm going to just date myself here, sisters, you know what I'm talking about. There are days I look in the mirror, I'm like, where did that wrinkle come from? <laughs> How did I get that gray hair? Who is looking me back in the mirror? Like my Nana said, you, when you turn after 40, she said, you got to start looking in the mirror because you will look around and you won't recognize yourself anymore. She said, you've got to be able to love all of it, all the wrinkles, all the gray hairs, all the hot flash. You got to be able to love it all because it's part and parcel of who we are. You got to have courage. You got to be able to finish the race. You got to be able to believe in something bigger than yourself. I'll end with something my son, who is now 20, he is a fencer at Lafayette College, a D1 fencer training for the Olympics. When he was four years old, he was in his room praying by himself. He was like, you know, he's calling out, God, help me. It's important. I need prayer by himself. 
So he sneezes and he yells out, God bless you, Amir. And so I bring him downstairs because I'm not just a mom, I'm also a researcher. And so I'm trying to figure out what you're praying for. Why are you saying God bless you, Amir? You're by yourself. What's going on? He said, well, mommy, sometimes when you're by yourself, you got to bless yourself. I'm like, you do. Sometimes when you're by yourself, you got to be able to bless yourself. When nobody believes in your vision, when nobody sees your goal, when nobody gets an anti-racist society, you got to be able to bless yourself. Because in the end, when we run, and we run forward. We may be running by ourselves, but like Maya Angelou said, we got 10,000 running with us. Thank you so much. I want to thank Dr. K for those powerful, powerful words. Repeat after me, we got to finish the race. We must be courageous. We must believe in something bigger than ourselves. Dr. K, your words resonate with us and help us to think and look forward uh, as we move towards our upcoming semester. If Dr. Watis Daniels could come up to the stage with the certificate. And I'd like to ask our distinguished keynote speaker if she would come up just for a photo, as well as uh, Dr. Jenkins, Madam Provost. Whoops. At this time, we will have a musical selection by our own Mr. Kevin Carr. The musical selection is If I Can Help Somebody by Alma Basil Androzo. Mr. Kevin Carr is Program Enrollment Specialist in the Graduate Studies pr Program here at Coppin State University. Can we have a round of applause for our own Mr. Kevin Carr? If I can help somebody as I pass along, 
If I can cheer so. With a word or song, if I can show somebody he is traveling. Shall not be in vain if I can do my duty as a Christian. No. If I can bring bad beauty to a world, 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 if I can spread the Lord's message that the Master then our living shall not be in vain. Then our living shall not be in vain. I can help somebody as I pass along, then I'll live here. Shall not be, then I living shall not be, then I living shall not be. Thank you, Mr. Carr. And such a perfect segue into our next presentation that recognizes our Eagle Awardees. And when you think of the, the title of the song, If I Can Help Somebody, uh, the individuals who we will be recognizing all have lived the spirit, not only of public service as exemplified by Dr. King, but they've helped many, many people several times over in Baltimore uh, and beyond. Uh, and at this time, I would like to uh, ask my colleagues who are members of the committee who will be introducing our awardees to please come to the platform. And just to provide context, uh, the Eagle Awardee uh, recognition uh, is one that uh, has been uh, 
granted to several distinguished members of our greater community throughout the years who have not only uh, exemplified, as I stated previously, the spirit of Dr. King in terms of public service, but they come from and represent all sectors of society, uh, business, uh, education, health care. I could go on and on and on. Some of those individuals uh, often um, are unsung in that they do the work not seeking recognition, but just trying to improve uh, society and improve our communities. Uh, and they're also are those who do great work and have been recognized, and we see what they do daily. And we, as a committee, um, we consider the recommendations made, and then we vote uh, on those individuals. And so what you see today is the persons for the 2023 Eagle Award uh, who have been recognized for their uh, tremendous work, and you will get to meet them, and you will get to hear more uh, from them. And so at this time, I'm going to ask uh, for Mr. James Brown to come up to the podium. Mr. Brown is the CSU Performing Arts Specialist, Department of Humanities, and what will happen is that Mr. Brown will then introduce uh, Ms. Catherine Orange, and we will have each of the respective uh, committee members introduce all of the awardees, and before uh, they exit, we will take a group picture with the president as well as our provost. And so I'm going to pass the baton now to Mr. Brown. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And Happy New Year. <laughs> It's not too late to say that for me. I say it all the way up until I don't see people again, you know, for the first time. Uh, good morning, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And it's also a pleasure and honor to introduce someone who I see as a friend uh, and a, a, um, a mentor, someone who I've learned a great deal from, um, Mrs. Catherine B. Orange uh, from the Arena Players. Uh, I'm not going to read her bio, that information is there. Uh, I met her there at the Arena Players, and one of the things that I learned right away is that Mrs. Orange takes no stuff off of anyone. <laughs> but her heart is huge. At, the, at one moment, she could uh, uh, admonish a student for doing something wrong but then at the same time make sure that student has something to eat. Uh, at the end of the program, sometimes students didn't have a ride, she would make sure that that student got a ride home, even if she had to take them herself. And then the next day, make sure that that student called their parents on time to come pick them up. <laughs> this is what Mrs. Orange has always done. I've learned to be somewhat of a Renaissance person because of her, because she can direct, she can do makeup, she can do costumes, uh, and obviously run a box office and also a youth theater program. And she can do all those in five minutes. Uh, but Mrs. Orange is beloved by her youth theater students. They come back, uh, she can call them up at any time and they would come back and support Arena Youth, youth Theater um, and, and Arena players in general. Um, pretty soon we're going to have some wonderful announcements to make about the organization. Uh, but today we're going to celebrate a woman that has truly given of herself to her students, to the organization, and also to uh, City High, um, Baltimore City College. Uh, she uh, taught English there, and I've met students there, uh, met students here who have, uh, who have attended Coppin, who remember Mrs. Orange, and uh, just lauded praises upon her. Uh, they just very much uh, enjoyed uh, being taught by her and being led by her and also given, being given that tough love by her as well. So let's welcome to the stage uh, a friend and a friend of ours and a Coppin alum, Mrs. Catherine B. Orange. Good morning. Good morning. I would like to thank you for the honor this morning 
And I'd like to say one of the things I'm always amazed when I come on this campus. I'm so filled up because I used to eat lunch in this building, but it didn't look like this. <laughs> when I came this morning, I told uh, the person who was dropping me off, I said, well, go around that way by, but I, James had told me to come to J, and I said, no, go around the back way because I know how to get in. Well, I wasn't sure when I got back there, but I am just so proud of Coppin and what has happened at this university and to have been a graduate. I graduated from Coppin in 1974 with um, a BA in English. And I tell everyone that my education at Coppin, I was here only here three and a half years before I graduated because I started late because I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. But I was talking to Margaret over here this morning because she was here at that time. And I told Margaret, I said, I had the best education at Coppin State College. I had the Sam Wilsons, the Dr. Crohn's, the Charles Pryors. And I remember being in Mr. Pryor's class one day in the summer, and he said, Catherine, are you an English major? I said, no, I'm not an English major. He said, well, I don't know why. I said, well, I think I'm gonna do history. He said, you should be an English major, and the rest is history. <laughs> I even had the experience to teach at Coppin when Coppin had an extension program in the evenings. And at that time, I was teaching at Lamell and I would come here and teach in the extension program. And I did it for 13 years. And um, Coppin, the other thing I always say about Coppin, when I got accepted for a master's program, it was uh, something called Teacher Corps. And um, I just graduated from Coppin and one of my friends said, Catherine, come and go with me and apply for this master's program. I said, girl, I already have a job. She said, come and go. I'll pick you up. I said, okay. So we went, came to Coppin, went to the graduate office, got the papers, filled them out, and had to take them to Dunbar, as I remember. And we both went, and then the gentleman said, um, well, we only, they interviewed about a thousand people from different states, and we're only going to be able to take 20 in Baltimore. However, if you get back in time with your papers and everything, we'll set up an interview. So of course we did, and I had an interview within about three days, and after the interview, I called my friend, I said, did you get a call? She said, yes. I said, well, how did your interview go? She said, not well. I said, oh, I'm so sorry, because I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, and I say that to say my, my education at Coppin, I was up, a, I went to, in that program, I had gone to school with students who had come from all over the United States. It was 20 of us. And I was always in competition with this young lady named Catherine, same as mine, who had graduated from Catholic U, and I aced her every time. And I thank Coppin for that. So that's just a little bit of stuff. My work with the Arena Players started with Sam Wilson, who also taught here. I took some classes with Sam, and Sam said, you need to come to Arena Players. I said, oh, Sam, I'm not coming to Arena Players. He said, come to Arena Players. So I, I went, and, and those of you who remember Sam, you know he's a great guy. And I, I started doing everything, makeup, backstage, I did everything. And um, after several years, Sam said, well, would you like to work with the youth theater? And I said, sure, because I love working with young people. 
all of my life, 50 years in the Baltimore City Public School System, I have worked with young people. I'm not always easy to get along with. I meet kids all the time, or adults all the time now who say, Miss Orange, you were so hard on me. I say yes. Y yesterday I talked to a young man who I taught at City, and he said to me, Miss Orange, I just called a thank you. He called the theater. He said, do you remember the day you saw me in the hall at City? I said, yeah. And he told me, oh, Miss Orange, I'm dropping out. I said, no, you're not. I said, you're not dropping out of school. Well, I can't pass Miss Dukes Maurice's class. I said, you will. So I went to the teacher and talked to her, and we got it straight. That young man today is a PhD. He worked at Coppin. His name is Michael Durant, but he no longer works at Coppin. But he told me that if I had not stopped him from dropping out of school, he would not be who he is today. So I love working with young people. And Dr. K, what she said about they are our future, we have to put all that we can in them. The youth theater, I have kids all over the United States. Well, they're not kids any now, any, anymore. I have a young lady who's on Broadway in Book of Mormons. All of my grandchildren went to Arena Players because if they, had to, if they stayed with me, they had to go to Arena Players. So uh, my youngest grandson now does theater all over the United States. There's a commercial on with a young lady that does a Crest commercial. I don't know if you've seen that commercial, but she's, she does this Crest commercial and she talks about the toothpaste and um, she's from Arena Players. We have young people all over, California, New York, Broadway, and what I do at Arena Players I think is so important because people don't realize the importance of the arts and how young people who are grounded in the arts do excellent jobs in all fields. So we have to remember that and remember that we need to give our young people all the help that we can give them. And to continue the legacy, my my role at Arena Players, as James says, I do everything, but I do it because I love it. I don't do it because I'm going to be honored or anything of that nature. I appreciate the honors, but I love what I do. I love teaching. I would still teach school if I wasn't so old, but uh, I love teaching and I enjoy working at the Arena Players, and it is my goal to continue the legacy, to keep training kids in theater to help them to grow and achieve their goals. And for that, I'm eternal, eternally grateful and will be grateful always for the work that we do at Arena Players in our youth theater. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I am honored and thrilled to introduce Dr. Mary Owen Southall. And uh, if it's okay with everybody, I'm going to follow Dr. Kay's lead. Clearly, Dr. Southall, you have not finished the race. You have finished this part of the race, and you finished it with courage, and you always work for something bigger than yourself. Now, most of you know Dr. Owen Southall as a teacher, and if you take a look, uh, not necessarily now, the first paragraph of that bio shows you she's a researcher 
and that she was in the forefront of the coronavirus research before the physicians knew they needed to be concerned about the coronavirus. As a biology major, how in the world, as an undergraduate, did she do what she did? Coppin State had, at that time, an HBCU grant. And the grant was to facilitate research in the HBCUs. Some of you may remember we had the McNair grant. This was analogous to that. And so as an undergraduate in a science building that predated the science building that we just tore down, she conducted research into the harvesting of ova, which means, yes, she had to perform surgery on those mice in order to find out if they could be developed into a new little mouse. And of course, that means she had to harvest the sperm and uh, fertilize them in a Petri dish. So while she was doing that, she also was planning for graduate school where she went to Rutgers University. And uh, you see, she became interested in virology. And at that time, this discipline was only just getting started. And uh, I will explain to you from her own words, her dissertation, which was a comparative analysis of the RNA fingerprint of the IV, IBV coronavirus. That meant she was looking at the RNA sequences of the virus to see whether they'd be causing people to get sick. Well, I mean, she wasn't dealing with people, but we all know how that came out about two years ago. Now, Dr. K says you also need to have courage. And at that point, that dissertation type topic that I just gave you was presented at the very first virology conference ever held in Syracuse University. Dr. Owens, who was almost finished with her doctorate, presented. And if I may quote Dr. Owens, there wasn't anybody in that room that looked like me. She was the only African-American at the conference. So uh, I would say that takes a good bit of courage. What about doing something bigger than herself? The coronavirus research and the RNA research and the virology particularly were very major topics at that time and she got quite a few really good offers. And as she was mulling them over in her mind, she decided she didn't want industry. And she got a call from one of her former teachers here at Coppin State, the late Dr. Gilbert Oganji, who was chair of the department, and he uh, offered her a position. And she came right on back and had a really tough interview, which included the delivery of a scholarly lecture on her topic. And then one of the interviewers asked her, what can you do for Coppin? And she said she'd come back here and be the hardest worker that she could possibly be. And she chose that bigger task over going into industry and making a whole lot more money. As, <laughs> and again, these are Dr. Owens' words, I came back to the land of creativity. That means we had less than nothing. And if those of you are sitting there saying, listen, lady, we had all kinds of labs. They had to use chemicals. Where did the chemicals come from? They came from the pockets of the faculty of the science department. And that was the case for far, far too long. So I only have three minutes, and I'll probably run over it, but I want to share with you three pieces of evidence with regard to Dr. 
Mary Owen Southall looking at something bigger than herself. Dr. Daryl Richardson, former student of Dr. Mary Owen Southall, has brought his expertise right back here to home and is currently at the Coppin Academy right here on this campus. Dr. Rachel Ray, a physician's assistant, and Dr. Marcus Allen, a chiropractor. Please know that she has given up space in the room only temporarily. Your space is always here and you will fill it. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Mary Ellen Suffolk. We were a holistic institution. The faculty and the staff were not separated. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Rollner. You have just given all of my remarks. <laughs> and so <laughs> I will keep them short. Yeah. Good morning, President Jenkins and Provost Waltz, um, guests, colleagues, and friends of our beloved Coppin State University. I would like to acknowledge my husband who has traveled with me today. Yeah. And I would also like to express my appreciation to the Martin Luther King Jr. Committee who worked tirelessly under the leadership of Drs. John Hudgens and Johnny Rice. Thank you. So I am deeply humbled by this recognition as one of this year's Eagle Awardees. This award, award is especially significant to me in that I am part of a very rich legacy of the Coppin State community, the Coppin State family. Many of you know my story, so I'm just going to be very brief and say to you that I am one of nine children and did not look at the aspect or the thought that I would attend college. Um, many of you know that at the age of 18, I was a licensed practical nurse and worked for years in pediatrics. And so that whole thing of service was ingrained in me very early on, and it continued here at Coppin State University. So I will say to you that there are many unsung heroes at Coppin State University, and many of them are in this room. You know, just look around this room. And so we know that the individuals here, the commitment to Coppin is one that is deeply ingrained, the love for Coppin and the love for our community. And I don't want to start calling names because I will get in trouble, but I must acknowledge one person that I have always admired. And you talk about carriage, Margaret Powell. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Margaret Powell, you, you know you can't tell me what to do, I'm going to do what I want to do. <laughs> Margaret Powell worked for years at Coppin and she was just a model for everyone to follow. I mean the kindness and the love that come from her for Coppin State is just immeasurable. But Margaret did something that I don't think I could do. She left Coppin. She retired from Coppin and taught school. Her girls and her boys and the love that she showed those kids. I'm going to call them kids. They're probably grown, some of them by now. But she did everything for them from taking them home, from feeding them, clothing them, and just teaching them, teaching them. And I will always remember that. Thank you. Yeah. So now I better get back to my notes, right? <laughs> okay, so there is something that Coppin has that no other institution does in the system. And that is that unique holistic approach to the preparation of our young people. And, and even though you may not be so young when you start Coppin, we still call you young. You're still one of ours. 
Coffin has a very important value in that it functions as a unit, family, and then lastly as an institution. There's something very important here. And everyone on this campus is involved in keeping our students safe. And when I say safe, I put that in quotes. We prepare them academically, but we also prepare them to hold their own. And I will say to you that, oh geez, almost 50 years ago, coming to Coppin, yeah, coming, oh okay. Anyhow, coming to Coppin, <laughs> I won't go there, President. <laughs> coming to Coppin almost 50 years ago, having been in a professional uh, place for several years prior to starting Coppin, there's something very special. that were models here, individuals that looked at us as individuals who listened to us, took time to listen to us, listened to our dreams, and then guided us on that path. The, the development of professionalism, but also that human side of each and every one of us. The expectation was that to you, who was at Coppin, you would, you've gained so much, you had to give it back. And so if there was a classmate who needed assistance, I can't tell you about the nights that we used to sneak cats out of the, they were prepared cats for research, that we would sneak cats, cats out of the lab and take them home. We would go to each other's apartments and homes and set up all night study sessions. You had to be part of the community. No one was allowed to walk alone. And so many nights those cats came out, the frogs came out, and parts of animals came out for us to study and learn for the sciences. The other thing is, you know, I listened to Miss Sange talk. We were in the same, yeah. So, you know, the interesting thing is that we did so much. We were a feisty group of students, but we had value. And we knew that we were valued by the faculty and staff. And that's very important. And that's a trait that I hope that Coppin never loses. Because when you begin to lose that, something else goes. And at the start of every semester, there would be telephone calls. If we didn't see someone standing in those long lines waiting to register for the coming semester, if we missed someone, telephone calls, we would make calls to folks and ask what was wrong. Did they need help? And so there were so many lessons learned. And so I've used up probably a lot of my minutes, but I need to, and I, I have more notes, but I need to say to you that, I need to say publicly that I am humbled, but I'm also a very privileged person. I am privileged to have been a student at Coppin State University. At that time, it was Coppin State College. And we know you could never say anything about our, our college. You know, it was almost like, you know, take off the earrings type thing <laughs> and roll up your gloves. You could not say anything bad about Coppin State University. I am privileged to have been taught by the very best. And I remain excited about Coppin State University when I look at the talent that abounds here now. I said to, where's Nick? He said, call him Nick. Nick came here as a, he was a student and then moved into faculty position. And I said to him today, isn't it exciting? You are now a senior faculty member. You know, and I'll, and I'll talk about him 22 years. He has been at Coffin. He is a senior faculty member. He is one of the best. When we talk about students being encouraged and inspired to go into mathematics. So he's there. And I tell you, all the rest of you whose name I do not call, I do honor you and recognize you. And I'm going to stop with the name calling. But I was also privileged to be under the tutelage of the great professional staff here at Coppin. Dr. Flossie Dedman. The hall is named after her. Dr. Geraldine Waters, Ms. Shirley Stokes. We're talking about women who walked with pride and there was no such thing as taking a back seat. 
And that was very important for me to learn that early, especially in my travels at Rutgers. At Rutgers, I was the first African American that many of those professors ever encountered. And I was at the Waxman Institute of Microbiology. There was one other African American person, and he became a very good friend, he and his family. But you know where he was? In the washroom, taking care of glassware. But what I had learned from him, as I had learned from my dad, was that no matter what job you do, you do it with dignity and you demand respect. And so I had to learn a very different way of fighting battles there. And I think I won some of them. And later, to be mentored by the members of the Department of Natural Sciences, and I call them the legacy team, Donald Tignor, who was in that, many of you remember him, he was in the Department of Natural Sciences in the 60s. And I believe that we were probably the first graduate, graduating class of the full team that taught in the sciences. Dr. Prince McCann, who was a phys physiologist, Dr. Ronnie Board, who was an expert in anatomy, Dr. Rao in organic chemistry, Dr. Krishnan in um, general chemistry. Dr. Sommerfeld from the math department was the one who taught us physics. And so the expectations were very high. We were expected to do research, but we were also expected to be very active in campus organizations and events and to reach out to the community. So that whole thing of service was ingrained and it was across the disciplines. So there are so many important things there. I just want to share just a couple more things and then I know my five minutes are running out. Judith, I'm, I'm going to work on this. So focus in the Coppin way. The focus was on the holistic, and I have to keep saying that word, holistic development of students that address academic preparation, self-efficacy, ethics, and the ability to transfer knowledge and experiences to enhance personal growth in pursuit of career goals. And this whole thing of transfer of knowledge, I'm very big on that, because what we know that currently, the literature is showing that when employers reach out to students, it isn't always about what they know exactly in the discipline, but how they can use that information to uh, troubleshoot and to make decisions and to become engaged with other individuals. Very important, relevancy and transfer of information. And this has not changed. This is something that has uh, been very important to Coppin over the decades. It's just that we now put fancy titles to some things and make believe that it's all new. It isn't new. This is what we have learned and what we have been exposed to. So I just want to say that there are many eagles, many friends of Coppin, definitely the co uh, our colleagues, the, um, the faculty. When I said I'm so excited about Coppin because I think when it comes to academic preparation, Coppin has the very best that there is with respect to faculty and staff. I don't know what it is, but we draw them in. And once they get here, that's when you look up 22 years at Coppin, 15 years at Coppin. And I will say to you that I came to Coppin for five and finished up with 38. So think about that. So with all of my former colleagues and colleagues, recent past colleagues and friends and staff members and I, accept this award, but I do so with the idea that I'm just a representative. That's all. Whatever I have done, I would have done anyway. Without the thought of recognition, I think it's so important to give back to our community. 
And so while there is much that I can share about my Coppin experience, and if you get me talking about being at Coppin, it just goes on. I can start from the day that I came here for an interview with Dean Byron. I can tell you exactly what I wore. I can tell you that when I came out of the old kind of hall and stood at the bottom of the steps, I talked to several of the students that were already here and what an engaging discussion it was. And I knew copying was going to be it for me. It was going to be it for me. And there was no thought when the opportunity came to return to Coppin that I would not do that. Coppin is where I want it to be. And so I am certainly very privileged to have had the experience of being here. And oh yeah, I retired, but guess what? I'm coming back to do work with the Alumni Association and sort of hang out in the department and do some other little things. But first I have to take a break. I have to take a break. Yeah. So I just want to finish by saying that um, my belief is that the topic for this breakfast is so timely. Social injustice and racism are rampant in every aspect of our society. But I do have something else that is my opinion and not necessarily that of the university. I believe that in addressing these issues that we must confront their factors, what, what is driving this and find ways to also heal ourselves. We need to reclaim our neighborhoods, ensure better academic preparation for our children, and provide those experiences that encourage self-discovery and awareness, self-love, and self-respect. So again, I thank you for the honor. I am privileged to be a part of this community and a product of this great institution. Thank you. Good morning. It is with great pleasure that I present our next awardee. Leon C. Purnell is the executive director of the Men and Family Center formerly known as the Men's Center Incorporated. He is also a lifelong resident of East Baltimore. Mr. Purnell is a product of Baltimore City Public Schools where he was awarded both scholarship and athletic scholarships. Leon attended both Morgan and Coppin State Colleges where he obtained a BS in social science and a master's in education, respectively. He worked as a counselor for both Woodburn Center and Woodland Job Corps, and he worked 13 years as a psychiatric therapist before joining the Men's Center as director in 1997. In addition to heading the Men and Family Center, he directly impacts health disparities through early detection, assessment, and the teaching of life skills, pre-employment skills, and case management to help strengthen families through advocacy, support, and direction with the re-entry population. Now that takes strength, Dr. K. He has many affiliations, such as a life member of Kappa Alpha Psi fraternity, the Edmund Alcorn Rites of Passage, the Wilmer, oh, I'm sorry, the Weinberg Fellowship, Greater Baltimore Leadership Graduation, former political affiliation, the new 45th political organization, the East Baltimore Democratic Organization better known as EDO, Leon has been a community advocate for many years. He is actively involved with the Baltimore EPEEB -P -E -E Human Rights Program. He is also the board member of the Environmental Justice Partnership in East Baltimore and currently the Vice President of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. 
and Baltimore chapter. It is with great joy that I present to you my friend, my colleague at one point, Mr. Leon C. Purnell. one of my Kappa brothers. <laughs> Good, morning. Good morning. I'm sorry I was late. I was doing some other things. Yesterday we had our day of service, uh, which we had for 17 straight years. Uh, on Martin Luther King's birthday, we do a day of service for the homeless. Uh, we do it several times a year, but it's special on Martin Luther King's birthday. Huh, what am I gonna talk about today? Well, let me tell you a little bit about the Men and Family Center. This center provides services to thousands of people a year. Uh, we help people that most people would just discard. And that's why we don't get the funding. Funding is important to programs such as mine because we deal with the grassroots problems. We don't talk about them, we deal with them. And so many people get money just by talking about them. And it's, it's something that the um, young lady just said, um, we need to deal with those problems. We can if we keep on putting Band-Aids over them and not addressing them. These are real problems. They, some of them could have been mitigated a long time ago had you dealt with the people when they first came out of prison. Get them acclimated in the community. You get them in a job. You don't have to worry about them going back, doing the things that got them in prison initially. We talk a lot about um, the squeegee kids. Let me bring that up. Squeegee kids have been around for a long time. I, I, when I was young, it was squeegee kids. I, it was squeezy adults. And the problem is that you have a, a select few that, that are possibly bad uh, kids. But you need to look at the reason that they're out there, first of all. Many of them are bringing food home to their brothers and sisters because their parents are not home. And that's what people need to consider when they start talking about them and stop using them in a negative content and address some of the positives. There's some kids out there that go to school all day, run out there and try to make enough money to put some food on the table. So, you know, before you frown upon them, think about their situation, their plight. It's not a, a happy one at all. And it was not one that most children should be having to confront. When I was um, a psych therapist, <laughs> one of the reasons I got out of that was because they were putting so many kids on psychotropic meds opposed to dealing with some of their issues. When they have an outbreak in the classroom, you don't talk to them. You just think they need medication. They need to be medicated. And that's not the right approach. You know, a lot of problems can be solved through discussion, through some caring, you know, and I just couldn't, I couldn't deal with that part. Um, there was a lot of money going from Hopkins to the schools because they wanted to come in and do these assessment of the kids. And almost all of them ended up on medication. So I stopped doing assessments on the kids. I said, I need to get out of this place and go somewhere else. And that's where I decided to go to the men's center. I had been courted for a couple of years. It started in 95, uh, an initiative to get men more involved in their children's lives. I did a lot with child support. <laughs> Johnny know that. Uh, a lot with child support, because that was a major issue. One of the things that I had uh, a problem with with that was that it's just about money with child support. It's just about money. 
the men that came to me, I said, look, if you don't have a job, you need to be the most recognized father in this school. And, and I made sure they did that. You know, when the child needed to be taken to school, they'd had to be at the mother's house on time and get them and take them to school. When they came back to me, they, Mr. Leon, I did what I was supposed to do. I said, good. Now, what, what do you have to do now? Oh, well, I got to go back at lunchtime because I'm helping with the lunch. So those type things kept them engaged with their children, and it meant more than just the dollars. See, those dollars go away, but that affection and that connection goes on. So uh, the, the fathers accompany them on field trips, a number of activities, and it, it really paid dividends because the fathers realized as soon as I get a job, we're going to do some other things. And that's the other part of it. You tell them, say, now we need to work on getting you employed so that you can really be engaged as a child's life, not just socially, but financially as well. So, but it's not right to take 90% of a, a man's uh, salary and expect them to continue working. It's not right. And I fought that vehemently with uh, child support for a number of years. I had men coming to me seriously crying because they worked two weeks and got a $20 check. So how do you help the situation when you're doing that? You look at some of the professional athletes, when they're working, when they're, they're a star, they're getting paid a lot of money. But when they leave that stardom and they become an automatic Joe, they can't afford to pay those $100,000 um, child support thing. And then everybody frown on them when they get locked up or something. Oh, he should be ashamed of himself. Yeah, he should, but the system needs to be able to adjust as well. So, you know, we have a lot of flaws in, in our system, and many of you can impact that, but you got to speak up. It's not going to change on its own. You must speak up. And one of the, if you know me and you know anything about East Baltimore, you know I speak up. And you know it's why I don't get a lot of the money. You know, I've been, in, I've been at the Men's Center for what, 23 years now. And this was the first year I got some money from them, and it was from a delegate. The first year from the city. And I've done all kind of collaboratives with them. I showed them how to get people in the doors to get tested. I had a free clinic at the Men and Family Center for 20 years. We dealt with people's health conditions before there was affordable health care, before Obamacare, as most people know it. You know, when I had frat brothers that I would go to their establishments because they were doctors and collect their sample meds and bring it back to our nurse. And she kept people physically fit and able to work off of those meds. It may not seem like a lot to you all, but it was the world to them because they couldn't understand why they was having these great headaches all the time. Why they ended up in the emergency room all the time. And my thing has always been, if you deal with a problem when it, when it presents itself and not let it get to a magnitude that is a major issue, you save a lot of money, you save a lot of time, and you save a lot of lives. So, I, you know, my message is to you um, that you have to speak up. You have to get involved because if you want to see change, you got to make it happen. It's not going to happen on its own. In this city, we've had a lot of black representatives in, in office. And I think it's really, really pitiful that so many black organizations go under as a result of the, the representation we have. I think it's pitiful. 
we've had some very, very significant programs that, that really impacted people's, people's lives go under that shouldn't have. And many of the ones that you see flourishing don't do anything. Pay attention to it. You know, you, you really have to look at it. When you donate money, look at where you donate your money to. If it's not doing what it's supposed to do, then you need to donate to somebody else. When I give my money, you better know that, that they better be doing what they're supposed to be doing. Because I work hard for it. And, you know, and I don't, I don't have a problem donating, but it, it definitely has to be deserving. So, um, I, I don't even know what I deserve, what, what I did to deserve this award. I, I get awards for stuff all the time. I don't even know what, what it is. I do what I do because I wanted to do it and it made my mother proud. No, seriously, I, my mother thought I was going to be a doctor or a lawyer because of my mouth. <laughs> and and, and I, um, I didn't care what it was. I just had to make my mother proud. When I came here, my grades stayed up because I wanted to make my mother proud. So I thank you for this award. I didn't know what I did to deserve it. But um, when I came to Coppin, I had one mission get the good grades and get out and start making some money. All right, thank you all. Thank you. I have the pleasure to present Jimmy Tadock. And Mr. Tadock is the executive director of the Merit Health Leadership Academy. And you have his bio with you. So he is now my new best friend. I have to say I have never met him before until today, but I knew of his work and I knew of the organization. And so let me tell you a little bit about that. The Merit Health Leadership Academy is an organization that helps students in high schools around, around um, Baltimore who are interested in STEM. And how I found him or found the organization is that even before pandemic, I had the opportunity of hearing about the organization and then I found out that I had a student that was in the program. And so I started to do a little investigation. Let me tell you, this organization not only helps to nurture students and give opportunities for individuals who are interested in STEM, but they also go beyond high school. And that was what fascinated me. That when I had this student in my class and she was having some difficulty and then kind of connecting to this organization, I found out that they were trying to help her by finding mentors and also finding tutors for her. So Mr. Tadok has only been at this organization for only nine months. However, comma, he has known Coppin for several years because he also worked with Upper Bound. And as we were walking across the parking lot, he started naming all the people that had been working here. So even though he may not be a graduate of our lovely institution, he is invested and has roots here at our institution because he is helping us to mold individuals into STEM careers. And so without further ado, I introduce to you, Mr. Jimmy Tata. Well, good morning. Again, um, thank you for the honor, but um, I should say that I consider this recognition uh, of an organization that is trying to help deal with the disparity, specifically in the state of Maryland, where about 31% of our residents are African American, but only 6% are physicians. Medical Education Resource Initiative for Teens or Merit 
tries to pull our most talented students from local high schools to give them an opportunity to find out what does it take to get terminal degrees in the healthcare field. We expect them to join us on Saturdays and throughout the summer to learn exactly what does it take to, to, to get to become a medical doctor. And that's where we're finding our struggles are. We have students that we work with that have an opportunity to shadow professional doc, doctors to understand what is it like. They get a chance to actually see operations. They see doctors interacting with patients doing rounds, but they also come back and tell us that the doctor said that they're working with students who have dogs and may have some affiliation with monkeys, which means we have to, we have to sort of understand where is that coming from, from doctors that are sharing these experiences or these thoughts with our young kids. And it's not just the kids we have to work with, it's the parents as well. The majority of our kids are first generation. The poor support and their families have no idea how to help their students. So our role is to help our students understand how they can be supportive parents. In the process of doing that, we have to make sure our students don't have dreams that are unrealistic. We have students that would love to go to out-of-state schools that they see somewhat prestigious, but are taking on thousands and thousands of dollars of student loans that's preventing them from going to medical school. That's preventing them from getting advanced degrees, and that's part of what our team is trying to address. We like to tell them there's nothing wrong with staying in Maryland to go to Coppin or Morgan or College Park to get that undergraduate degree to move on to be able to get the terminal degrees that they see later. We also think it's important to keep in mind that many of our students are dealing with issues that, that are related to mental health and they have no idea how to deal with it. So every Saturday we're with our kids, we have to address issues with those that are products of gun violence in the neighborhood, families living in food deserts, students who feel ostracized for being STEM majors, for being geeks, and that's all part of what we believe we have to deal with every year. So again, it's not Jimmy Tad like this doing the work. We're just part of a village that's trying to do our best to help our, breath, our, our brightest and most talented students understand they potentially can help deal with this disparity where we have, again, 31% of our, of our families, of our people of color in the state of Maryland, but only 6% are physicians. So again, we thank you. And finally, I guess it's a call of action because I hope to be knocking on doors, getting additional mentors, connecting with programs because we also understand it's not just getting them into college, but it's getting them through college. So again, we hope to be able to take advantage of some renewed, some rekindled relationships to help our students realize their dreams. Thank you very much. Again, can we have a round of applause for our Eagle awardees? And I would ask if each of the awardees could just come up front and also if Dr. Watis Daniels would make sure they have their certificates. I'd ask uh, President Jenkins and Provost Wilkes if they could also join us for this collective picture. Is it best? Oh, down. Maybe down. Let's down. do down. Yeah. Okay. Oh, no.
At this time, we will begin our CSU Memorial Tribute. Uh, this video presentation uh, will be introduced by Mr. James Brown. Before I start, is this Mr. Tadlock? Is this your phone? Oh, okay. All right. Hello, everyone, again. So, 15 years ago, Dr. Hudgens brought together a group of faculty and staff to address a noticeable absence at Coppin State University that we attended tributes to Martin Luther King Jr., we joined in the parade, we accepted awards in his name at many places except here at an HBCU, our HBCU, our Coppin. We should have some activity and what it would look like might not look like what others do, it could be big or small, but we had to do something. We decided on a breakfast worked with the university to get the funding, chose a date, selected honorees, and you and I are here today because it's important to recognize, um, you, oh, I'm, excuse me, I skipped. Um, you and I are here today because um, it's important to recognize the work that Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. did on behalf of the entire world. So while we were debating and scheduling and trading ideas, we received notifications that members of our Coppin community had finished their race, um, were enjoying a well-earned well eternal rest. So could we, should we take a moment to say their names during our first MLK Junior Tribute? Why then and still, why now? As you were reminded today, Reverend King encouraged us to value each other, everyone's life and work has equal value. So what better time to give focus back to those who stood with us in the trenches than while we are focusing on a man who sometimes stood by himself. We've been honored to meet and work with the people whom we salute today. We cherish them, we will miss them, and what they left behind. We do mourn, and while remembering the hugs, the kindness, the meals, the jokes, conversations, and all the things that drew us to them. Join, us, join me as we give focus back to those memorable eagles whose work lives on here at Coppin. Amen. 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 Tell you something, children. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Yeah, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. I let it shine. Let it shine to show my love. I'm gonna tell you that everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. And everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. Yeah, everywhere I go, I'm gonna. Let it shine, I let it shine, I let it shine to show my love. I got to tell you that 
even in my home I'm gonna let it shine and even in my home I'm gonna let it shine yeah even in my home I'm gonna let it shine I let it shine I let it shine to show my love I think I see my neighbor coming. I better let it shine. Yeah. When I see my neighbor coming, I'm gonna let it shine. I let it shine. I let it shine. So my love. How I like to say. Would everybody join me on the last chorus? Everybody? Hey, hey man, a little louder. Hey, hey man, with the spirit. Hey, hey man, hey man, hey man. <laughs> And um, I did want to share, we just found out yesterday that we did lose another one of our members, Dr. Uh, Martin Hales, um, passed away yesterday. So we will recognize him in next year's tribute. Uh, but I just wanted you to know why he was not up here in case you uh, heard that he had passed. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Gone, but definitely not forgotten. At this moment, we will have a musical selection performed by Mr. Kevin Carr, You'll Never Walk Alone. And don't be afraid of the dark at the end of a storm is a golden strain and the sweet silver sound of a Walk on through the rain, though your dreams be tossed and blown. Walk on, walk on with hope in your heart and your name. Alone, 
Lord, your name. Mr. Carr again for lending his uh, time, talent, and treasures to uh, this event uh, today. At this time, we will have our reflections, and I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Pamela Richardson Wilkes, our Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs here at the Coppin State University. Can we clap it up for her? Good morning. First, I want to say um, thank you to Dr. Whitehead in her absence um, for her staring and awe-inspiring uh, words that she gave us this morning. I want to say thank you to those individuals who have uh, been awarded and congratulations on your awards and that we Look forward to your continued excellence in the work and service that you're doing for our communities. Um, and thank you for also your support in being here today with us at the great Coppin State University. Um, again, I, I bring you greetings um, on behalf of the Division of Academic Affairs. And I want to say and would be remiss in saying thank you to Dr. Rice Thank you to Dr. Hudgens, who served as co-chairs of this committee. And I'm going to ask at this moment if they would stand and we give recognition to them for their excellence in this program that they've conducted on this morning. Thank you. I also want to say thank you to all the members of the 2023 MLK Junior Tribute Planning Committee for providing this opportunity to coalesce in the spirit of Dr. King and this notion of moving beyond race. So if we would again give them a round of applause for their hard work and diligence. Change does not roll in on the wheels of inevitability but comes through continuous struggle. And so we must straighten our backs and work for our freedom. A man can't ride you unless your back is bent. Martin Luther King Jr. At this juncture in American society, we must contend with agencies, authorities, and advocates that reinforce those socioeconomic systems that intend to denigrate not only the philosophy of the great, late Dr. King, but oppress, suppress, and regress all of the work towards the creation of an anti-race society by the very perpetuation of it. The systemic racism that pervades the education, 
justice, and social organizations that seek to engage, empower, and uplift people of African descent are just as dangerous as they were during, pre, and post-Reconstruction into the Civil Rights Age. The Civil Rights did not end with desegregation, but rather was further inflamed by it. Therefore, as we move into what the white supremacist mindset would like to address as the post-racial moment in America, do not be engaged in empty rhetoric. Rather, use your words, your pens, your actions, and your works to justify the need for further social engagement, reform, and policy. Allow for the integration and promotion of our importance and not just simply the assimilation and omission of our culture, our creativity, our voice, and our contribution to this landscape to be the mainstay. That historically black colleges and universities are not just places of refuge, but rather places of opportunity for knowledge, for economic and social growth. And in the words of Dr. King himself, whatever your life's work is, do it well. A man should do his job so well that the living, the dead, and the unborn could do it no better. Let's do a good work so that no man can only not do it better, but more importantly, not undo it at all. I thank you for joining us today, and let's continue this towards the creation of an anti-racist society, anti society so that my grandmother, who was born in 1925, could stop giving the advice that she gave to her granddaughter who was born in 1975, who still has to give the same advice to her 11-year-old child who was born in 2013 to be careful of where to go, what to do, what to say, and that our future generations will not have to have the same conversations. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Provost. Next, we'll have Dr. Nicholas Eugene, professor, CSU Mathematics and Computer Science, and also the president of the CSU Faculty Senate, Dr. Nicholas Eugene. Good morning, everyone. And thank you, Dr. Rice, for inviting me to provide um, this reflection on um, Dr. King's birthday tribute. And uh, I want to thank you, Dr. Wright, also for planning this event. I think it's very well organized. And um, thank you for putting this together. So um, let's give Dr. Rice a big round of applause. <laughs> and I know I will speak a left, but I think um, she also deserves a big round of applause. I, I think her. The words were moving and inspiring. And, and to tell you the truth, you could tell that she, is, she was authentically dedicated to um, the social justice causes of Dr. King, um, that Dr. King advocated for. And, uh, and, and so she deserves a, a round of applause, even when she's not here. So, so as we get ready to begin this new, new semester, uh, um, a new year, and we take this opportunity to to celebrate Dr. King. You know, I'm I'm reminded of um, how courageous he was, and uh, I'm just reminded of courageous leadership and the power of people to get organized and uh, to petition for support for a larger cause, and. Uh, to bring to be a change agent and not just a change agent but to a change agent to transform lives uh, I've always believed that working at a university is a privilege um, you get to inspire and uh, and impact the lives of thousands of students I mean it, it is really a privilege uh, and so we owe it to our students and to our communities also, that we be courageous in how we lead. Um, we need to be courageous in how we organize our students and to organize them to be civically engaged. 
I think too many times we, we, we get an education, we get an, a degree, but we're not civically engaged, especially as it entails to our electoral process. Um, and to be involved in such things as voter registration, I think that is very important because these things matter. Um, I think we have to be courageous to speak out against discrimination, whether it's because of race, ethnicity, gender identity, disability, or sexual orientation. I think um, when we see it, we gotta speak out against it. And, and finally, what I'd like to say is to our faculty, um, and I don't see many of us in here now, but um, you gotta speak out against any injustice that you see, whether it's to our students, to our staff, administrators, and to our own colleagues, because being courageous matters. And so we should speak out against those things. Thank you. At this time, I would like to invite uh, Ms. Sheila Chase, or a representative from the Staff Senate. Okay, if we don't have a representative from the Staff Senate, I will proceed. And Dr. Hudgens had an important meeting that he had to go to, so he asked if I could just bring to uh, a close some comments. And first and foremost, I want to thank the university community as well as the Baltimore community for supporting this annual event. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's a team, it's a collective team that's been able to uh, provide um, the planning for this event. Uh, and it's no form and fashion can, can I take all the credit, uh, nor Dr. Hudgens, uh, we have a committed group of faculty uh, that has been a longstanding support in support of this event. And I'd like to take a moment just again to ask the planning committee if they could please stand. <laughs> Dr. Darlene Brothers Gray, Mr. James Brown, Dr. Melissa Buckley, Dr. Irma Johnson, Dr. F. Michelle Richardson, Dr. Claudia Thorne, Dr. Danita Tolson, Dr. Judith Wilner, Dr. Denise Watis Daniels. I thank you. It's a pleasure for us to work together uh, to uh, plan this event. Uh, and also a special thanks to Thompson Hospitality, Events and Conferences and Services, the Office of the President, uh, particularly the Office of the Provost and their support of this event, institutional advancement, university relations, uh, and information technology uh, division. If we could give Kelly and Rob just a... <laughs> yeah. We, we give a lot of claps here. We're building up the capital for our next event. <laughs> We're building up that capital. Don't look at us like that, Kelly. Uh, so again, we appreciate uh, you all coming out. And also, I want to thank Coppin Academy uh, for their participation, their support of this event. We always look for uh, spaces and places where we can collectively work together and support them, particularly those students who are dual enrolled uh, with Coppin Academy and our university. So if we can, for Principal Allman and the Coppin Academy family, also give them a round of applause. Mm. I don't have much to say at this juncture. I think Dr. K uh, said it all, and I think our uh, Eagle Awardees exemplify why we do what we do in recognizing um, Dr. King every year. Uh, the dream is still alive, but as we can gather from what we see and what we've heard, particularly from Dr. K, yet there's still work that needs to be done. Uh, and so as a university, and as a community, we're uniquely positioned to work together to affect positive change. And so hopefully events such as this are uplifting, give us the fuel that we need, the wind that we need, so that we can continue to push forward. So I thank you. 
At this time, we will have a musical selection, We Shall Overcome Video Presentation. Uh, this is, will be by C.A. Tenley, lyrics by L. Simmons, and performed by N. Graham. Thank you. Again, I want to uh, thank you all, uh, and just I'd be remiss if I did not recognize we had an additional student join us, Mr. Wesley Rice. No relation, <laughs> but a great student. <laughs> also, want to thank uh, Dean Beverly O'Brien uh, for allowing, uh, providing support, uh, and allowing me to be able to um, spend uh, time on this committee and make a contribution to uh, all of our guests. Um, online uh, and also for our guests here today. This brings to a formal close our 15th annual tribute celebration. Look forward to seeing you next year. Please enjoy the remainder of your day and remember, do something. Thank you. <laughs>